In far off Rome, the Emperor Nero is very displeased with the defeat of Cestius Gallus, but he realizes that he has to take matters in hand, and so he sends a much more significant general, here shown as Vespasian, to deal with these rebels in Judea. And at this point, we should introduce very briefly Josephus, who originally was given command of the northern region in the Galil, and he's a very important figure for us because he is the primary historian that we rely upon, not only for the first Roman-Jewish war, he was a, a, a first-person participant in that war, and so he's actually relaying things that he saw himself, but he also goes on to a great career as one of the really important Roman historians overall, providing a particular a detailed look at Judaism in antiquity, and we have had occasion to return to him in many cases. At any rate, Josephus, a fairly young man, is uh, an associated primarily with the Pharisees, although he had some experience with all of the relevant groups at the time. Uh, he's given command of the north, very important region, uh, but unfortunately the first that is attacked by Vespasian, who comes in with 60,000 troops, and in the space of 67, the year 67, he essentially conquers the entire region. In the center there, you see the city of Yotapata, uh, in modern Hebrew, Yodfat, which is uh, where Josephus was housed. And uh, he actually withstood a long siege of over a month until finally they were forced to surrender. As a result of a bizarre suicide pact that Josephus manages to survive, he surrenders to Vespasian and then convinces Vespasian that he can be a very useful ally for him and a tool for him. Vespasian ultimately takes Josephus at his word and he ends up becoming kind of like the official Jewish expert. He, In other words, he turns coat. He becomes a uh, an ally of the Romans, betraying his countrymen, which makes him uh, a difficult source to rely on in many ways. But nevertheless, Josephus is our main resource for the entire period. And Josephus will describe the rest of the war. In Jerusalem, there's tremendous chaos. The rebel leaders who are active, particularly in the Galil region in the north, flee the conflict and they make their way to Jerusalem, where there are now several different competing leaders. Uh, there are the leaders of the local aristocracy and the high priesthood who were at the center of what ended up becoming sort of a provisional government that was set up in the beginning of the war in 66. But the competing factions fight bitterly and in fact execute the heads of the united leadership including the high priest there is tremendous rivalry between all of the factions of the zealots to the point that they not only fight with each other they even burn each other's siege supplies which turns out to be disastrous because of course vespasian will ultimately organize a siege against them it gets so awful that the zealots who are based in Masada at this time, that's a very important fortress on the uh, banks of the Dead Sea, not too far south of Jerusalem, they actually attack the nearby village, a Jewish village of Ein Gedi, on Passover night as a result of these kind of internal conflicts. Meanwhile, the Jews are fighting with each other bitterly in Jerusalem and in the region. Vespasian takes his time and he mops up the naval resistance at Yafo. There were several sea battles there and some smaller conflicts around Jerusalem, but he leaves Jerusalem alone throughout the year 68. At that point, Nero dies, and there is a very significant competition in Rome for who is going to be the next emperor. Ultimately, Vespasian is invited to take that role, and he returns to Rome in the year 70. He hands the command over to his son Titus, also a very able general, who will ultimately bring the battle to its conclusion by attacking Jerusalem itself. By the time Titus approaches Jerusalem, there are two main leaders left in the region, uh, Shimon ben Gioria and John of Giscala. And they're fighting bitterly with each other, but when they realize they're about to be attacked by Titus, they decide to put aside their differences temporarily. By the time Titus arrives, there are about 25,000 rebels in the city who are fighting against four Roman legions of about 80,000 battle-hardened troops. On the map here, you can see how the battle goes. Uh, first, Vespasian and his forces breach the outer wall 
in the summer of the year 70. They enter the northern part of the city, and after a week, they're able to breach the second wall that lets them into the, uh, the old city towards uh, the Temple Mount, which is the primary uh, goal of their advance. Uh, they attack the Antonia Fortress, which is this region that was built by Herod at the very north of the Temple Mount complex, you see in that square area there on the center right. But the rebels actually managed to push away Vespasian's attack in mid-June of that year. Vespasian then turns his attention to building a siege wall all the way around the city in order to choke off any food supplies that could come in. He lets the Jews essentially starve for about two weeks. They're softened up by hunger. Let us not forget that the zealots, in their zeal to beat one another, they actually burned most of their siege supplies. So they did not have extensive foodstuffs. And after about two weeks or so of the uh, the impermeable wall being in place, then he makes a second advance in late July of the year 70. The fortress ultimately falls, and this results in the destruction of the temple itself. This occurred on the ninth day of the month of Av. It would have been in late August of the year 70. And to the present day, this particular event is marked by fasting by Jews all around the world. Uh, they, they sit on the floor, they read the Book of Lamentations, uh, and they, uh, they endure this day of mourning for an event that occurred 2,000 years ago. The temple is burned to the ground. The fighting would continue throughout Jerusalem, but we're going to continue with that in the next video. Thank you for watching.